I've just been looking at this book which is called The, uh, up the Art Instinct by Dennis Dutton uh, and it just relates to some stuff I've been talking about recently so well in relation to situated knowledge and possibly feminist epistemology, I don't know, I'll see what you think anyway. But it's, it's, it's a great book, I really enjoy this, it's about um, evolutionary aesthetics and the, uh, the biological and the evolutionary origins of uh, yeah, well, aesthetics, why we find certain things beautiful or attractive and find other things repellent. And he makes a good case, I think. But this particular bit is fantastic, he's talking about um, sexual selection theory. So he's talking about how, um, well, the impact that the fact that we are uh, sexually reproducing species and not only that we're a conscious sexual sexually reproducing species the the effect that that's had on the development of our uh, cognitive abilities our psychology and our aesthetics uh, and he, he kind of describes this as a sort of backdoor teleology he says that because we have the ability to not only to respond kind of in i think he's out overrunning the ball a bit to be honest but he says not only are we able to kind of respond instinctively to our environment in that kind of contingent, um, yeah, that contingent way that's characteristic of evolutionary process, we're also able to make quite far-reaching predictions, particularly in things like um, mate choice. So choosing our mates <coughs> carries with it intentionality, he says. Uh, and it's an intentionality which projects quite a long way into the future and hence gives this whole thing a an air of teleology which other kinds of uh, adaptive processes don't. Now that's not really what I wanted to talk about, it's the phraseology they use which I just think is fantastic. He's been talking about this and he, he, he talks about two things one after the other and the fact that he chooses these two things is just great I think, it's hilarious. Um, okay let me just find the exact point. Uh, okay so he's talking about He's about to talk about mate choice, but he gives this example first. And he's, he's talking about how we effectively kind of design ourselves through this mate choice by selectively choosing one particular kind of mate over another, and that process going on for generation after generation. We're kind of ratcheting ourselves upwards in a certain aesthetic direction. Um, sorry, I just lost my, pay, my place here. Okay, so he says this. He says, uh, other animals aside, it is absolutely clear that with the human race, sexual selection describes a revived evolutionary teleology, the reintroduction of intentional intelligent design into the evolutionary process. The designer, however, is not a deity, but human individuals themselves. So he's not talking about intelligent design, he's talking about you know, proper Darwinian processes. Though it is directed towards other human beings, it is as purposive as the domestication of those wolf descendants that became familiar household pets. That's the first thing. Every Pleistocene man who chose to bed, protect and provision a woman because she struck him as, say, witty and healthy and because her eyes lit up in the presence of children along with every woman who chose a man because of his extraordinary hunting skills, delightful sense of humour and generosity, was making a rational, inte intentional choice that in the end built much of the human personality as we now know it. Um, I think there's a couple of things there. I mean, the first thing is that although he does say, when he's talking about men and women, women in relation to, to sexual selection, he does add this bit on about, yeah, women find men attractive and, and, and they're making sexual uh, sele sexually selective choices. The, the bit where he's talking about men making those choices is very... Um, uh, it, it's kind of telegraphed in a way that the, the opposite isn't. These these uh, these uh, Pleistocene men who were chose who were choosing to bed and protect their their women folk is is foregrounded with this other bit about oh yeah and the women have got some choice in this as well. It does feel very tacked on. That's the first thing to say. But the fact that he he does this after he talks about the domestication of wolves is fantastic because one thing I'm pretty sure about is that. Of course, we do have domesticated dogs, and those domesticated dogs did evolve from wolves. I am pretty sure that that process was not one in which Pleistocene man or any other kind of proto-human went out there, captured a wild wolf, and then tried to domesticate it. 
That's not how the process would work. The process would work where wolves, you know, real wolves, real dangerous animals, would um, largely stay away from humans unless they could bring one down and kill it. But, but occasionally one would wander near the fireside, wander a little bit more, a little bit closer, and be, perhaps be tossed a bone occasionally, who knows. But uh, if anybody was doing the domesticating, it was the wolves themselves. They were learning to how to operate in the presence of, uh, of humans. It is absolutely not that uh, humans, or men as he puts it, went out there and grabbed these wolves and domesticated them, turned them almost against their will into um, servant dogs. Uh, it's the wolves themselves that did the, did the domestication for good symbiotic relationship reasons. So the fact that he's putting that, he's, you know, he's, he's uh, characterizing the those proto-humans the, and the male end of those proto-humans as these kind of active dynamic guys who are going out there catching wolves and taming these wolves and then going out and presumably catching and taming these women and bedding them and supporting them is uh, is very characteristic of the things I've talked about in one other videos, I think, to do with how, um, you know, the way that story is narrated and which facts are highlighted and which um, which facts are perhaps pushed a little bit further back and even the sequence in which these things are presented situates that knowledge in a really particular way um, locates it around a set of active principles in relation to a set of passive principles uh, and I think basically it's just, just damage to the story really I'm just not convinced the story is quite like that but um, yeah fascinating and it's it's a great book I'm not I'm not dismissing the book at all but uh, that particular phraseology just fantastic